are you here? Yeah, I'll jump yes. out. So, Hi. and thank you, Simo. You you yep. will hear Simo a lot in the yes. <laughs> in the next day. later on. <laughs> so, Samantha, do you want to say something briefly about yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I uh, work as an application specialist at CSC, IT Center for Science. You will hear about that also, I think, last day of this workshop more. Um, I work there in uh, user support, outreach and uh, training. And I'm also community manager of the Code Refinery project, which we will be talking about now a little bit. And uh, I also do still my PhD on very low part time at Aalto University about satellite remote sensing stuff. Excellent. So what we wanted to cover in the next 25 minutes and then we can have a break for 10 minutes to stretch our legs is to mention the importance of reproducibility and open science. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of reproducibility, but most likely I know that many of the people watching are starting their summer internship or starting their uh, doctoral research career. You want you know, to be reproducible. You want to start from the first day to make sure that what you've been doing today, what you've been working on today, you can replicate it in one month. So the materials that are linked now from this, uh, from the schedule of the day are from the so-called Code Refinery workshop. And as Samantha has mentioned, Code Refinery is a larger workshop that covers various aspects of the so-called computational reproducibility. So in this short 25 minutes, the, the workshop is actually lasting for six days, three hours every day, three hours and a half. Here in this short slot, we just want to inspire you giving a bit of, of a motivation of why reproducibility is important and then how does it fit into the picture of the code refinery workshop. For those who will be interested in the next code refinery workshop, it is now planned in the first half of September. So if you register for this course and you mark that you want to stay up to date, you will receive further emails when the registrations are open. But in general, when it comes to reproducibility, the situation is like this. So this is a a professor with some research assistant, or actually this is a doctoral, doctoral researcher, and the professor say, don't worry, you don't have to start from, you don't have to start your code from scratch, which is, you know, it's, it's great. You got some code from the previous postdoc or whoever. You can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote several years ago. Are there instructions for how to use it? Mm, I doubt it. Is the code commented? Mm, not likely. Uh, where are the files? Who knows? this is going to be painful, isn't it? Uh, it's just a scratch. So I don't know about you, Samantha, but I've seen this situation. <laughs> I don't know. I still see it on a, on a, maybe not daily basis, but weekly basis, which is, but I almost, mean, yeah. yeah, it's also understandable. People join a research project, whether they are for an internship, whether they are for those years of the doctoral research, and then they move on, they change university. And then if there's not a culture of preserving, archiving and making things reproducible and documented, this process will, will keep on staying. So we don't need now to go through the whole page, but in general, what you can think when you read a scientific article that the article is actually just the tip of the whole process of getting the data, collecting the data, analyzing the data, producing the statistical results, summaries, tables, outputs, whatever. And, uh, and so the article, sometimes with the article itself, it's impossible to replicate what other people are doing. So you need the documentation on the process, on the software. You need maybe actually access to the actual code or to the actual data. And sometimes even if you have the, like, the same code and the same data, you still get different numbers. And this is because maybe the environment, the libraries, the operating system and other things have changed in the meantime. So all these parameters, all the elements you see here would actually be needed for achieving the reproducibility. So in these materials that you see linked there, you can browse them like, like this. We cover various aspects of the so-called, you know, pyramid that you just show. But it's nice to put it all in the context of the code refinery workshop. So Samantha maybe would be better than me to give an overview of this of this picture. One, two, three, four, five, six steps. Do you wanna yes. briefly? 
Yes, I can do that. And here maybe also just uh, in addition to what Enrico already mentioned, so we have these workshops twice a year, but we also have these lesson materials that Enrico is showing right now. And there is a link to this in the collaborative notes as well. So you can also go through the materials yourself, see what interests you and maybe learn something new related to this. So um, we have really liked this little figure here by Heidi Seibold who made it about these six helpful steps for reproducible research. So it all starts already from the very beginning when you, when you start your research journey and you start having files, uh, you start creating folders. And there it already is very useful to take a step back and think about your naming and how you order things. And there is multiple like, uh, guides out there who can give you a, like a, a structure that you can follow that's always very useful to do. And that's something that uh, this reproducible research um, lesson that we're showing here is also about. So we talk a little bit about like uh, different naming, naming conventions that you can follow, uh, different structures that you can follow um, and so on. So in our workshop, that's day four, like it's noted here, but it's the first day of where it goes actually deep into the different tools and techniques that you can use for your research. Um, yeah, then this is also already um, step two, use good names for them. Also for functions, if you write your own code, uh, you can save a lot of documentation and commenting things if you just have good names for your things. Um, and that is also mentioned in uh, our documentation lesson, how to do document your research software and in the modular code development lessons that we have. Then I mentioned already documentation is a very important step because uh, you might be working on different projects. So if you have been doing something and you had uh, a really good reason for setting something up in a certain way, you might not remember that when you get back to it like two days later, a week later, a year later. And then also when others take a look at your, your codes or your software as a whole, um, it helps you to kind of keep your time free because not everyone has to come and run to you and ask you about like, oh, uh, how, how do I actually use this? Or why is it done that way? That's stupid. Um, so you can do that by documenting your codes from the beginning. And there's different levels of doing that. And that's what we also talk about in this documentation lesson. And then the first week of the Code Refiner workshop is all about version control. Uh, why you would want to use it, what it is, what it actually is, how to use it for yourself, how to use it um, when you are collaborating with others, and um, to understand a bit on what's behind different commands that you might have already used, like commands like git clone, for example, uh, git push, git commit, these things. Um, hopefully you have heard about this before, but if not, then the first week of the Code Refinery Workshop introduces this on a very, uh, how to say, uh, shallow learning curve. <laughs> so you start with what you might already know, and then you go deeper and deeper step by step into that you can in the end work together with others um, using version control. Um, then step five here, stabilizing the computing environment and the software that basically many of our lessons have in some way. We talk about Jupyter Notebooks for doing that. That's a nice way of collaborating with others, with, uh, but also to prototyping for yourself. In the reproducible research lesson, we talk about this um, with, uh, what is it called? No, I, no, I missed the word, but containers we talk about. <laughs> we talk about workflows there, like how you can uh, run multiple steps of your analysis pipeline, for example, automatically without having to worry too much about, is it run in the right order? Is it run on all my files and so on? And then also about like, I still don't remember the word, but these uh, computing environments that you can create with virtual environment, with Conda, for example. You might have heard about these things before. And what's behind that? Why do you want to use them? And how can you use them to make your research more reproducible? 
And then um, also a little bit about publishing your research outputs. So you will have maybe in the end of your research project, you will have code, you will have data, you will have other documents. And those are, I don't want to say useless, but less useful for others when they are just lying on your own computer. And um, there is a few things that you have to think about then, like uh, yeah, what kind of license do I want to add to my code? Do I want others to easily reuse it? Or do I maybe not want others to reuse it? And does my university have guidelines on this? And um, these are the things that we are talking in this social coding and open software lesson. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I believe that, in my opinion, these six steps are extremely useful because truly, if I start a new project, I'm I'm really starting with the, you know with the folders with the files, and um, as Samantha has already mentioned, all of these six steps that you see here from the you know day zero setting up the folder and uh, gathering the code that you already have, uh, I've written some documentation, some readme so called file. Already, all these materials are available. I can give you a demo or help you kind of browsing these materials. So the materials that are linked from the web page from today is this reproducible research. And so there, for example, there is the section that is about organizing your project. And here, now I will not go through the teaching part, but you see, this is a kind of a standard folder structure that you can create for a new project. There are, you can create this manually, or you can even, there are, how can I say, automated way to create this type of folder structures. We discussed this here, they are linked here. But the goal actually, what is important when it comes to reproducibility is that often you're not working alone. You maybe are working with other people, with other colleagues. So most likely you want to have a share place, a share project name with share convention. So it's very important that you actually talk with your peers. If you don't yet, already have a standardized way of storing the data, storing the, the process data, the results, the code, and so on. It's it's now a good moment to, to start the discussion. And for example, use these pages for, for getting inspirations and, um, and, and already starting from the very beginning with reproducibility in mind. Another aspect that Samantha touched was about the so-called um, computational steps. So of course, version control, for those who are using Git. By the way, we have added in our share notes document a little question to know if you're already familiar with Git version control or not. But in general, we need to also record the computational steps because it's very rare that you just have one single script that will just load the data, do some math and save the outputs. Most likely there's many steps to do. And again, this type of steps there's no other way to document them except you know having humans writing writing what the actual steps order so in this other part of the reproducibility lesson you can see some ways of how to record steps there's the so-called scripts where you could basically write the plot of all the code that you need to run but in general even have a simple so-called readme file so a txt file that is living there close to the code that will just tell to the future user in one year or in five years, first you need to run the function or the Python script name like this. And second, you will need to run another one and so on. Here in this lesson, there are also some advanced things. This is the beauty of the code refinery materials that they are written as accessible as possible. So there's no prerequisite, but also the more experienced user can learn something new. So for example, there are workflow tools and snake make is one of them. If you know what's make, snake make is kind of uses the same principle, but instead of building code, like you would do with make building software, you would actually use it for basically writing a so-called icyclic pipeline to, to basically go from the input data to the actual derivatives file that you need. In the same lesson that we're browsing here quickly, then we go to the level of dependencies. And this is, again, another XKCD to inspire people, but this is truly what it is in uh, all modern digital infrastructure. So this is not just about, about research. This is about all the services that you use that sometimes, if not always, 
they are based on components like this little block there that is a project by some random person in Nebraska that has been thanklessly maintained since 2003. There are many, many examples of this type of project. There's the curl, for example, which is one of the most used protocol and tool to, to transfer data between system. And it used to be for many years just a random person somewhere i think in sweden <laughs> that was maintaining it now it's it's better maintained but in general this is this is the thing that even though you are good at documenting your code and your data and you know so that hopefully in five years or even yourself in one year after peer review to be able to rerun things you then realize that in the meantime the python library that you were using has changed that the python 3 dot something had a problem and now you need to upgrade to the new python and nothing works anymore so sometimes you really need to preserve not just the code and the documentation and the data but also all the dependencies all the libraries that are attached again here this is just a quick intro 10 minutes, they were working together. But if you're starting a new project, it's very much important to invest in fixing the versions of the tools that you want to use. And, um, and, and basically, you know, agreeing on what type of uh, libraries you will use and uh, defining this type of dependencies and so on. So in this uh, lesson, for those who are familiar with the so-called Conda is, is one way of taking care of Python environments where you can define all the type of dependencies that your code has. So if you are starting today a new project, it's good to have a discussion again with your colleagues and uh, agree, for example, on uh, what type of libraries do you want to use and what type of dependencies your project should have. So this is at the level of the dependencies of the software sometimes in some cases you really need to go to the highest level that you need to have also that the environment that the whole operating system is reproducible we recently moved from an old operating system to a new operating system with our triton cluster and sometimes it's most of the software were working in the new operating system, but there were some specific cases that were dependent on the old operating system. So one way to get over this type of dependency that is related to the actual system is to adopt containers. So with what with containers, they are basically it's like a, not only having the libraries that you need and the code that you need, but it's really having the full image of the operating system where everything runs on top. If you remember at the beginning, I was talking about the operating system and all these other layers up to the user. <clears throat> so with the container, it's really this joke that it works on my machine. Well, then we'll ship your machine. And this is our Docker, which is one of these container technologies. Again here, we don't have the time to cover to the containers, but you know that if you have this type of problem or if you have had this type of need that you would like to move the full pipeline from one from one system, from one cluster to another, then it's good to invest in learning in learning containers. Here, these are simple learning materials <clears throat> that you can read by yourself and test things by yourself. But in general, we also have more advanced courses for those cases. And this kind of covers everything from this um, reproducibility lesson and this reproducibility summary. We still have five minutes. I don't know if Samantha is still here with me. Yes. But in general, the code refinery um, workshop doesn't only cover, even though the reproducibility is at the code of the code refinery workshop, code refinery is like a large also informal network. Let me type the address. A large informal network of basically people who are passionate on um, data science, software, open science, good practices. They join together and they discuss together. I don't know if Samantha, if we still have five minutes, do you want to mention of the type of engagement that people could have with the code refinery, especially we're looking for ambassadors. <laughs> Do you want to tell something? I can also open some of these uh, 
other links if you if you want me to. So yes, um, maybe the the first entry point into Code Refiner is to visit one of our workshops. So our next workshop is coming up, like Enrico already mentioned there, and it's uh, written there September 10th to 12th and 17th to 19th. It's always half a day, and we will talk about all the topics that I mentioned in this uh, reproducible research steps. Um, and then if you get excited about this, or if you maybe are already excited about uh, these topics that we have been talking about here now, then we are already uh, always looking for uh, contributors to the lesson material, for example, or also just people in different places that uh, will advertise the workshop to their network, because that's one of the hardest things that we have to do is to actually get this message that these workshops exist to the people that uh, have use of it. We very often get the feedback, oh, I wish I would have known this in the beginning of my PhD or something like this. So you can help with that. So um, if this is something that interests you, the best way is to sign up for our newsletter, then you will get a message when uh, actually the registration opens for our workshop. And then you can send that forward to your network. And if you like doing that kind of stuff, like spreading the word about code refinery, like maybe you go to conferences and you have talks about, I don't know, your own topic. And if you just want to add one little slide about code refinery, just make, making your network aware that it exists, then uh, becoming an ambassador is uh, a, nice, a nice way of supporting us. And we also want to support you doing that. So if you go in the top, um, about join and for individuals. So there are uh, all the different ways uh, that you can engage with the community are mentioned here. And if you scroll a little bit down, there is this code refinery ambassador. Um, so if you want to become one, then uh, let us know. And that can work either via our contact email address, which you can also find on that page, or by joining our Zulip chat, or you can also let um, us know via the collaborative document of this course, for example. Um, we will read that and then we will reach out to you and we will have meetups of the ambassadors and like try to support you in any way we can. We also have stickers that you can distribute that always gets people interested in things. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're very happy to connect with you, but yeah, also, just joining as a learner, joining uh, um, in Alto, for example, we will have an uh, in-person room where you can follow the workshop all together, together with Enrico. And you will have Enrico there, like answering all your questions that you might, might have regarding the material. So it's a really nice and community experience to join mm -hmm. the workshop in Otaniemi. For those who are, well, hopefully some of you are listening actually were in some of the recent workshops, for example, the March workshop, but we are all very open with our lessons and also documentation from the workshop. So let's say that you don't want to wait for September the 10th and you already want to start learning, you can click on the March workshop and there you see the schedule and for each part of the schedule, let's say day one, introduction to version control, there are links to the lesson material. There are links to the videos, to the recording. So truly, if one wanted, you could actually have, you could actually do the full workshop by yourself with just using the videos, the recordings, the ar archive materials, the archive questions, and all the lesson materials that are there. But of course, yeah, it's more fun to do it together, to do it with a colleague. Here at Alto, we're trying to promote this type of hybrid room so that people can come here, have some cookies, fruits, and at the same time, watch the stream. The stream still happens on Twitch TV, so being in person is not necessary, especially because Code Refinery is a Nordic network. So we have people streaming from Norway, from Denmark, from Sweden, and so on. But then the social part is, is also important, especially during the exercises where there can be some interesting questions or, or things like that. But anyway, hopefully this was motivational enough. Thank you so much, Samantha, for joining us for this overview, very quick overview of the whole code refinery. Thanks for having me. Yes. And we are perfectly on time. It's 12.50. So let's quickly check if there's anything in the notes that should be mentioned. 
but eventually we can um, we can get to the notes later. Maybe let's have the break now until uh, one o'clock sharp. And um, please stretch your legs, have a glass of water, and see you. The stream will start again at um, one p.m. Finish time and at the hour in other time zones. Thank you.